Good morning. This is Steve. Just, uh, I can't even get through my own introduction. Just, um, I thought to myself, I'm going to take a wager to see if I can get through this this morning or not. Steve Stice, Chief Medical Officer at the University of Kansas Health System. We're here in the Dolph Simons Family Studio, and we have a really important important program this morning. And the overall message today, I'm just going to break it to you right now. The, the message for today is don't get sick waiting to get sick. Don't get sick worrying about COVID. So we're going to talk a lot about that this morning. To my right, Dr. Hawkeye, Doc Hawk, Dana Hawkinson, the Medical Director of Infection Prevention and Control. And to my left, returning to our program today, is Dave Lisbon, a longtime friend of mine and, and uh, one of our outstanding emergency room physicians. We're also really lucky to be joined by two great physicians on the phone this morning. One is Dr. Mary Champion, an outstanding ophthalmologist and somebody who has to put up with me as a patient, and Mark Wiley, uh, one of our outstanding cardiologists, who is also the chair of cardiology and who has to put up with me as a friend. So from all these people, I hope that they can get along with me this morning as we begin to think about um, how to stay well. A quick note, though, we do want to say a big thank you. Last week, if you'll remember, we had Operation Barbecue Relief. It brought 5,000 meals to our health system and presented Dana Hawkinson where they're for, with their four millionth meal that they had donated. <clears throat> That's a pretty big deal. We shared this uh, moment with our community as, 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 and we're very grateful that that happened. And I think Dana really enjoyed the barbecue because I watched him eat it, even as I was trying to just get in line and get some myself. So was it great barbecue? It was great barbecue. I washed my hands before that, but um, yeah, it was great. And you wash your hands very afterwards, tasty. I'm sure. Yeah. I wash my hands afterwards. You always afterwards. have to wash your hands after barbecue yes. though. That's, that's just and baseline. And my face. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That too. I would have to wash my entire clothes because my barbecue <laughs> tends to go in a lot of places. This Thursday, another big thank you coming to feed our hardworking health system employees. Olathe Wahlburgers, the Olathe Fire Department in Hy-Vee are teaming up with our health system to bring over 1,100 hamburgers tomorrow. We'll share that um, live on our Facebook channel if you'd like to join us and be a part of our expression of thank you back to the community as the community thanks so many of our frontline healthcare workers. We really appreciate all the support that comes to our folks, more than you'll ever know. So this morning, um, Dana, how are things going? Yep. So again, we, uh, this week we have seen a, a decrease in our cases from the start of the week. Uh, we were around 31 at the beginning. We are down to 22 patients in the hospital right now, which is good. Hopefully our equilibrium, as we said, is maybe 20 to 30. Hopefully it's more around the 20. And 10 of those patients are in the ICU. So we have had some um, discharges, which is really good. And also um, gotten some people out of the ICU to the regular floor. So that's which is really great. Thing. Especially as we look at reopening society, I know we're all anxious anxiously mm -hmm. watching the numbers very carefully to make sure there's not some kind of a surge that yep. we, we have, we, we, we're going to account for. I'm going to first turn to Dave Lisbon. So Dave, uh, what, what exciting news in the emergency room? Well, you know, I think we're seeing a, I guess, if you will, a, a bounce back in patient volume. As I said, uh, the first, uh, I think the first segment I was on, we'd actually seen our volume drop almost yeah. 50%, which was like, I think it was the which was, it was a shock, actually, yeah. because when we closed the clinics, we were like, okay, the ER is going to get really crazy busy. But instead, no, I was, think people were afraid. Yeah, people were. I think people were afraid. And once again, I think they listened. I have to come to some of that conclusion that they did everything they could to stay away. And that really cut our volume in half. I think as a, in 25 years, 30 years as an emergency physician, I've never worked at a pace that slow. It was, it was kind of almost... Twilight zone-ish, you know, not to see yeah. patients kind of coming through the door. But I, I, I'm, I'm glad to report from the standpoint that we're here to serve. The numbers are starting to tick back up. They're not quite at our uh, 180, 190 patients a day, but but they're getting they're getting above the 120. So that's been that's been um, gratifying to watch. And you know, we're kind of motor-driven type people, so we like yeah. to do. We like to do. So, Dr. Champion, you, you had to put up with me in clinic the other day. <clears throat> I have a couple eye issues, so I called down there, and, and, and I was fortunate enough that, uh, that you, you could see me. But you were talking a little bit about some of the challenges of getting people back to the clinic and even some people being pretty afraid of COVID. Talk to us a little bit about some of that in our conversation. Yeah, so um, over the last 
few weeks, um, my colleagues and I have seen, uh, I think in other clinics too, a, a drop in patients. And we've also been seeing patients presenting um, late with vision threatening or, you know, with uh, conditions or with vision loss. We've seen retinal detachments that have uh, been, been ongoing for several weeks that people waited, infections of the eye that, you know, went too long, and corneal transplant rejections. And for me, um, I've been seeing patients um, have chosen to delay getting uh, their treatment for macular degeneration uh, for fear of coming into the clinic or, you know, for fear of leaving their homes. Um, and I started calling some of my patients who had decided to cancel or delay their appointments you know, to kind of understand why um, they had made that decision. And, you know, several expressed that they were losing vision, that they um, had seen a decrease in their vision, but they were really concerned about coming into a healthcare setting. Um, they were concerned about the waiting room or being around other people. Um, and I think that, you know, most people ha who haven't been to our facilities um, in the last couple months don't realize that they look very different. Um, so I talk to my patients about, you know, how very different our waiting room looks because we're not really um, putting people in the waiting room anymore. We're direct rooming patients um, basically, you know, from the front door to their exam room. Um, they have very limited interactions with staff um, as we're doing the check-in process and the workups with one technician. And then their visits are actually a lot quicker uh, because, you know, they're not, they're not waiting um, we're also all wearing masks, and you know, everybody in the clinic is in a mask now. So I think patients um, were very reassured, and I've had several of those patients who um, canceled or delayed their appointments in the last couple of weeks rescheduled to come in. Um, and we are, like I said, seeing um, patients who have waited and had vision loss, but we're hoping that you know, we can get the message out that it's safe to be here and that we absolutely you know, want to take care of our patients. We don't want you to suffer at home. Um, we can see you and we want to see you, um, and we're doing it um, in the safest way that we know how. Yeah, and I think that I was impressed because when I went into the to, for my appointment, I got stopped at the front desk. They checked my temperature, made sure I had a mask on, and and uh, made sure I did my hands, and 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 then I kind of waited outside before going in, and then I got right into an exam room. And and, and as you mentioned, and and uh, I think it, I was really impressed by you know I, I felt safe, and 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 I'm I'm kind of watching to see how things are working and make sure he's doing it right, and I, I felt really good about that experience. Mark Wiley, when down in cardiology, we've heard rumors out there in the community that people are having um, like small heart attacks at home and not getting into the hospital, not getting into the, not getting into care. Talk to us a little bit about that. What, what's going on? Yeah, thanks, Steve. You know, early on, uh, we were kind of watching trends, and there were there were a lot of news stories coming out about how heart attacks were going down during the uh, COVID crisis, and. Um, we started to see patients that uh, were at home kind of waiting things out and then having to come in emergently. Uh, you know, early on, it was really trying to balance the, the risk of coming in versus the risk of not coming in. And um, you're exactly right. I think um, there have been many situations where a patient's had a stress test and we're trying to decide the timing of a, a heart cath. And, you know, we put that off a week because they were stable, then they come in emergently. So... Um, we've been seeing the same thing. Um, so our message has really been, uh, you know, cardiac issues really, it's very difficult to have them wait. Um, and we're starting to get patients back in, which is great. That is good. And, and certainly that's something that can't wait uh, about a heart attack or losing your vision, David. And when people are coming into the emergency room, the ones who arrive, are they sicker than you want to see them? I, I heard rumors of people with diabetes out of control and, and what we would call DKA coming in really late in the course as opposed to earlier in the course. Yeah, we've unfortunately seen a, a number of cases of of that, both DKA, congestive heart failure, where Dr. Wiley and his colleagues' patients are, um, you know, maybe taking an extra dose of their uh, medicine to help um, stave off things, but really they're at a point where their heart can no longer compensate, and they did, they have, we have seen some cases that came in a little bit, like I said, uh, uh, later than they should have. Um, and, you know, we haven't had to take too many extreme measures, but, but certainly disease processes are more advanced. You know, I had one story of a young lady, she was, well, a, a lady who came in and uh, she was having what we call classical anginal symptoms. And they were so pronounced that as she had been at home calling the nursing line to try and see how much longer she could wait, it, she, she told me that she was told that if you don't go to the hospital, I'm gonna call 911 to come get you. 
So I mean, I think the whole system is, had become aware that, wow, people are, are making choices out of fear about COVID that are ultimately not the best for them. So um, luckily, she was able to be taken care of, admitted, and, and further worked up. Yeah. So, Dana, we've really gone to a lot of measures to try and improve our infection control in the hospital and in our practices. Mm -hmm. Talk to us a little bit about those and how effective we think they're going to be. Yeah. You know, as we said from day one, we have been developing protocols and practices and systems for emerging infectious diseases for years now. And as this has happened, especially in the last two to three months, uh, that evolution has become even higher velocity. So we have done a lot of things to protect healthcare workers and patients and loved ones from coming into contact with the infection. Uh, things such as universal masking, so the healthcare workers are masked, um, the patients when they come through, whether it's the clinics or the ER, are masked, and that will help prevent um, a lot of the gross spread of the respiratory droplets, again, with cough or even talking. So we've done that. In addition, we've also um, had, you know, we continue to uh, train our healthcare providers, our nurses, our physicians, our therapists, about the proper way to put on and off the PPE, as well as the proper hand hygiene and continue to reinforce hand hygiene um, in, in that sense and when seeing a patient. In addition, we've also, as you talked about when you go to the, um, when you went to the ophthalmologist, clinic, we uh, are doing screening by temperature screening, but also a questionnaire as well. So we are, we are doing all those things for our patients and for our healthcare workers um, so that we can continue to maintain a safe environment here. Yeah, so again, don't get sick because you're afraid of being sick. So there, I'm sure there are going to be questions out there about the safety of coming to, to get care. Let's take those from our media or from our, our listening audience this morning. Anyone out well, there? I, I have some questions. Um, I haven't had any come in yet uh, regarding safety, um, but uh, we, we do have some general questions. One person just asked, um, what do you feel is the most significant contributing factor in seeing patients recover who had been in the ICU? What do we think is the most important factor to people getting better, Dana? What do you think? Um, well, I think the first thing is um, the patient themselves, the patient's dynamics. We don't know all of those dynamics about what's going on with the inflammatory process with the infection. Second, it's our care team. Um, they have been trained and have been doing critical care for years and decades in some cases. So we have very good care teams with uh, nurses, physicians, therapists working side by side, giving the oxygen therapy or the ventilator therapy that you need, giving the crucial drugs that you need. And then last of all, it's time. You know, we do have a therapeutics group who meets um, almost daily, who continues to evaluate the evidence on new drugs. What are the best drugs to use to try and uh, get recovery from COVID? But really, there's nothing proven at this point. There is some information about remdesivir, but there are caveats out as well. So I think it's, again, the actual people giving the care, and um, around that is the drugs, the, ventilate, the ventilator, all the supportive care that goes along with that. And I would just say from an ICU perspective, having people who are younger and healthier tend to do better than people who are older and sicker. Mm -hmm. I do would say point out that there have been some things that we've done that we know are changing the outcome of the disease. One is prone ventilation. Prone ventilation. That's, been, that's been demonstrated and proved. So we, we, we've learned, you know, in the last six, eight weeks, we've learned a ton. Mm -hmm. And I think prone ventilation, using anticoagulation, anticoagulation. and some some other therapies are going to make a difference. And, and even steroids, which were thought to be mm -hmm. awful, are now looking back and saying, oh, wait a minute, there may be some isolated cases where we need to do that. And finally, um, this new there was a, even an article this morning about using remdesivir in combination with other antiviral medications, not unlike how we approached HIV and Hep C at different points in the evolution of those, our treatments for those diseases. Yep, and I think with all of that um, comes the timing of these uh, drugs, of these therapeutics. So when do we give it? Early versus late. You know, again, I think that you mentioned the anticoagulation, which is something to prevent blood clots because we know that that, um, in our experience here in the United States, it seems like that is becoming more and more of a significant sequelae or problem after you get the infection. Um, we hear stories all the time now about um, patients, even young patients in their 30s who, uh, there was a, a, an anecdote the other day or a report 
a 38 year old gentleman woke up because he couldn't feel his legs. He was otherwise healthy and he had large blood clots throughout his vascular system. So, so those things happen and, and that's why the risk is so bad with this disease because I think you are rolling the dice. You don't know if that's going to happen to you. It's not just the viral infection. It's not like influenza or another common cold, but there are subsequent problems after the infection that can occur. So hopefully giving the anticoagulation, the blood thinner, in the right uh, timing and the right dose will help prevent those things as well. Yeah, I think it's really that team approach. And, and again, getting here earlier. Dr. Champion, what, what can we tell our patients about the warning signs, for example, of losing vision and um, floaters and the things you try and talk to me about all the time? What, what can we tell our patients? Because I think the longer people wait, the harder it is to recover. Yeah, there are, you know, that's the case in a, a lot of conditions that affect the eyes, that the outcomes are much better the earlier the problem is diagnosed and treated. So, um, you know, in patients who have new floaters in your vision, you know, things moving around, uh, flashes of light, um, any areas in your vision that seem grayed out or dark or like a shadow, or even just difficulty with near vision. You know, if you close one eye and you can see prints the way you could the week before and then you close that eye and look with the other eye, and things are blurry or they look distorted, um, those are things that, uh, you know, you need to be seen for. And with um, the, the advent of telehealth in the last couple of months, we, we've been able to do uh, a lot of that triage over the phone. You know, you can get a hold of a physician to do a televisit, and we can decide, you know, is this something that needs to be seen today or tomorrow or this week? Um, and there are, you know, a few cases where, you know, if you have a pain or, you know, it looks like maybe there's uh, an infection starting, we can do some of those visits um, over the, you know, over telehealth. Um, but I think, you know, the, the key is just at the very least call us, you know, again, speak to a physician um, as soon as you have symptoms and we can help, you know, direct when you need to be seen. But many of those eye conditions, you can recover vision, you can keep good vision if they're diagnosed early and treated early. Um, when you wait, sometimes if, if, you know, we delay treatment, we don't always get back the same vision that we, that we started with. Yeah, and, and Mark, I, I, that's got to be true with heart attacks as well. I mean, people staying at home with angina or symptoms of that. Talk to us a little bit about some of the warning signs of, of heart disease and what are some of the things that people may not, they're trying to just wait through, um, maybe some of the more atypical features. Yeah, um, so that's a, that's a great, great question. Um, so, yeah, with heart disease, obviously cardiac disease, uh, some of the presentations aren't always intuitive. Um, the most common thing, obviously, is chest pain. Uh, one of the things we preach quite a bit is, is our changes in exercise tolerance. So, you know, if you're out walking and a lot of people are getting outside more and you notice a change in your exercise tolerance or reduction, um, sometimes that's an early warning sign. Um, you know, cardiac disease and, and angina, blocked arteries, they present differently for different people. Sometimes it's chest pain. Sometimes it's shortness of breath. Uh, jaw pain, back pain, uh, you know, classic left shoulder pain. Um, and it's easy to minimize some of the symptoms. Um, and before, we would have patients come in and see us, and we'd evaluate them, or they'd be referred. And I think patients are, have been a little bit more reluctant just because of all the uncertainty. Um, and it's, it is important to get in soon uh, to get these symptoms evaluated so that we can stem off problems uh, before they happen, you know. And like you said, it's, I've been just amazed by the effort and the approach um, and everything that's been done at the hospital and in the clinic. Um, it's it's got to be the safest place in, in the city, quite honestly. So um, it is exactly important right. to identify these symptoms. I think yeah, it is important yeah. to identify. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, Sorry about that. It's, it's important to identify these early and get in as, as soon as you can. Yeah, and that, you know, I think that is just so incredibly important. So um, I'm going to look at Dr. Lisbon. So, Dave, yeah. we did a bunch of stuff right off to make the emergency room safe. And we got sure. a COVID area, non-COVID right, area. Talk right. to us about the things you guys are doing down there. And I know there's some information you wanted to show us about. Sure, sure. Um, I, you know, a quick story about our areas that we've kind of charted off really quickly. We had a, a gentleman who came in, a uh, complaint of abdominal discomfort, nausea, vomiting. Didn't look very ill, had really very little in the way of medical history. 
industry. But quickly got him back, got him worked up. I thought, like, maybe you could have COVID. There are some things that make me wonder. I got an X-ray. Um, fully expecting it to be negative. We test him, get in touch with him, as our surveillance team here has been doing. Um, and lo and behold, his X-ray uh, came back looking quite, as the word we use sometimes, gnarly. Very bad, you know, infiltrates. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, this could be regular pneumonia, but it's a good chance it could be COVID. So I went and talked to the gentleman. And it's interesting, you know, uh, he was very reluctant to be admitted to the hospital. A, he was feeling well, but his biggest concern was finances. You know, he didn't feel like he could pay a hospital bill. And, and yeah. what we end up doing frequently is talking about, hey, you know, we've got financial counselors. I don't think anybody's expecting you to pay a bill right off. You know, hospitals are flexible. Um, and, and, you know, he's still elected to leave. And, and so I do what I usually do is say, hey, we're always glad to see you back. If this gets any worse in any way, come back, please. Find us, please. Yeah. And he actually did about four hours later. And based on uh, what the hospital has been able to do, he was able, we knew the result and it was positive. And so he got the care he needed. And I was very uh, gratified to know that, you know, spending the time with the patient uh, to explain the full range of things was was very useful for him. And he, he came in and got treated. So really, there are a couple of messages here. One message is, if you're sick, don't get sick waiting to get sick, right? I mean, meaning meaning that if you're you're afraid that, that of coming to get COVID and getting sick from that because you think you're going to get that at a hospital, then you may get sick with your underlying disease. Is it already true? Yeah. And you could have COVID. You, you want could to have that. COVID. And, and you know, yeah. I think that the, the point is, what's the safest place in the city right now? Sure. I think sure. it's your house if you're sheltering at home in the way the mm -hmm, best you can. Mm -hmm. And I think they're hospitals. Yeah. Because we have gone to such extremes to be sure that people are safe. I want to point out something Dana said earlier that, that we've talked a little bit about earlier. This whole thing about being ready for emerging diseases. Mm -hmm. We have a unit in our hospital that's devoted entirely to emerging diseases. And it's not used all the time because right. there may not be a new one out there. But as soon as we get ready, bang, down go the curtains. Here comes the th stuff. And we are ready for yeah. anything, whether it was Ebola, H1N1, or now with uh, now SARS-CoV-2. So really, that level of preparation is what it takes to battle back about stuff like this. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Yeah. And all Dr. Right. Lisbon last week said, I can treat critical illness and treat you when you're critically killed, but I would just, I would prefer not to. So please, <laughs> yeah, please yeah, come, come sooner before right. before you reach that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's imperative. All right. Other questions. Yes. Uh, somebody was just asking uh, about our outpatient labs. How have we made them safer? You bet. You want to talk about that one? Yeah. Uh, you know, it's basically the same things that we've talked about with our clinics. Um, we have uh, screeners, we have masking, we've protected uh, because when you do get blood labs, obviously you're pretty close to the person drawing your blood, so our employees are wearing masks. Um, hand hygiene, it's basically the same universal pillar of practices that we're using all throughout the health system. And so that's that's how we've yeah, done it. It is really that everybody you're going to come in contact with, and we screen our, like said, we screen our employees every day, both with a questionnaire yeah. and a temperature check, and, and they're, they are wearing masks or wearing things to help prevent mm -hmm. anything from coming on to you, and then you as a patient would have a mask on, and then we'll have the stuff to wash your hands. Yep. Okay, David, now you have a chart you brought today, and I want you to talk about that, because you spent some time on this. Sure, sure. You know, <laughs> as I've been, been trying to get, you know, of course, a visual aid for those of us that aren't educated. Yeah. Right, right. I, I laid out some waves that people had thought, uh, you know, the, the whole system would experience from, from caregivers to people who were patients to all the folks who are collateral to, to this whole endeavor. And it talked about various waves that we would experience as COVID kind of went through time. Uh, and everybody, you know, that I talked to thought this graph was great because it didn't put specific time parameters. It's just that we're going to experience mm -hmm. these uh, 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 waves of, of interacting with this virus and everything that it does. And, you know, sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words and, and you see it up there. And uh, I, I think it's, it's attributed to Dr. Sung, I believe, at the University of Colorado, who um, really talked about this first wave of, of the immediate morbidity and mortality of COVID. So all of us in, in, in health care, from the physicians to nursing, got to experience this incredible crunch of, of, of really sick people. Uh, people who we didn't expect to be sick, young people, certainly older people, and we had to get novel in how we tried to treat them, even without knowing exactly what we were dealing with. And then, as we've been talking about here today, and, and Dr. Champion and Dr. Wiley, we saw this second wave where the impact of, of resource restriction and some of that resource was the ready access to clinics. 
uh, held people back and, and, and may have had some consequences. Um, and then this third wave is this, as time continues to expand out, the impact of interrupted care on chronic conditions. So uh, a good example, I think, so I had a couple of patients who were being what we call worked up for chronic kidney disease. They put some of that off. Um, maybe it got a little bit worse, and, and, and then they're going to move to dialysis or preparation for transplant. But all these things got moved back because uh, the healthcare systems were so busy, of course, trying to take care of the acutely ill mm -hmm. uh, patient. And then there is this further portion um, out, further out of, of the various types of things that people experience from having taken care of such a severe disease and being experiencing all of the stress of that close up. And I think you did a marvelous job with Dr. Uh, Williamson last week just talking about you know, the issues of people's underlying uh, mental health struggles or, or, or challenges and how this may have impacted that. The economic injury is, of course, a very real thing. Individuals not being able to work, uh, even to the point of the example I just gave, somebody's now a bit more concerned about how they'll pay a hospital bill because the, the income is, is gone. And then, as, as all of us in healthcare and other professions, I, I, I certainly expect, have to deal with this thing called burnout. And, and you know, me and Steve used to share a, a, a a similar job occupation, which was residency director. Uh, so we, we train young people in uh, going from medical school to being proficient physicians, and uh, a great highlight of my career at this point. But we took a real serious look at how their mental health needed to be addressed and guarded, wow. and, and looking at how we can best train people uh, as, as teaching physicians, bringing our best self to make sure they ultimately get out and practice medicine with their best self. So I, I just thought this picture uh, was really uh, poignant as it related to kind of what we're experiencing as a health collective. Um, you know, Steve's words proved um, preescient and when he talked about, or prescient, sorry, when he talked about everybody will know somebody who's had this. And, I, and I've known five to six people in all three buckets, you know, from death to ICU stay and discharge to relatively mild illness and, yeah, and quarantine. Yeah, it's true, isn't it? So yeah, you were you were you were more than accurate about that, and so I think uh, there's going to be a lot of different parts to play. You know, I'm a person who doodles a lot. I even thought, man, it'd be great if there was a fifth wave that that took what we learned from this and, and was better prepared next time and did some aspirational things as it related to, you know, how big entities like hospitals, government, private industry can work together to be ready uh, if there's another surge like this and, and of course, undergirding uh, our, our populations as they need it. So, yeah, so, yeah. I think that's a really important point. And I think, you know, last week we said it doesn't matter if you're a Republican, a, de a Democrat, an Independent, or a Martian. We all, <laughs> we all, we're all in pandemics together, and, and it, 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 isn't, it isn't going to, uh, it isn't going to follow political, geographic, racial, ethnic, or, or economic boundaries. So I understand there's another question. Uh, KCUR is reporting that the White House Task Force has named Kansas City a national COVID-19 hotspot. They are pointing to the outbreaks of Lansing and St. Joe, which appear to be the leading factors. Can you put that into perspective for us? What does that mean? Yeah, you bet. Dana, you and I could take a crack at this one, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think the major message is that COVID-19 is here. It's in our area. We know that. And when we get to open up more and that virus has more places to spread more people to infect that could very well cause you know a surge or the surge that we were hoping we weren't going to get after this first wave but I think the main issue is that yes it's here and um, we know that people can spread it without having symptoms and so as people get out to be in more public areas less restrictions there's a very real chance that that could spread more to become the hotspot that it's talking about. And I think, you know, it's nice to be labeled one of the greatest places to live and one of the great places <laughs> right. to go and the jewel of the Midwest spot. and all that. That's good. But you don't want to be called the hotspot. If you start breaking it down, it, it, it really doesn't come as a surprise. Right. In St. Joe, there was a meatpacking plant. Lansing is a state prison. 
who, by the way, have done a really good job of, of handling this crisis. All the COVID prisoners that are positive for this state come to Lansing, and there they're taken care of, and they've got a, a strong infirmary, and, and I think they've done a really good job. We've had a few of their folks, mm -hmm. but they really do a, 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 have done a good job of, of handling that. Um, and and so there, this is what we face, though, and, and, the, and the common theme here is when people come together in smaller environments, the risk of getting a lot of folks infected, be it a meatpacking plant, a prison, a school, a university, a church, these are our challenges. And as we re-enter society and we try to open up society, the question is going to be not will there be COVID, because there will be COVID, right? You can count on it. The question is how do we respond and are we going to be able to follow the rules of personal responsibility that will help us control this. If we don't wash our hands, if we don't cough into our elbows, if we don't try to follow all the things we've been preaching on this show for the last, I don't know, few weeks, I guess, ever <laughs> since the beginning of time, it feels like, <laughs> eight weeks, eight wow. weeks. Wow. Um, if, we, if, we, if we don't do those things, then we're gonna be a hot spot, and it comes down to that. What do we have to our, our advantage, or our biggest advantage is that we don't have the population density of some of our larger urban areas like New York and Chicago and Detroit. Because of that lower population density it gives us an inherent advantage, but we can squander that advantage if we don't take and follow the rules of infection control. If you follow the rules, our chances are gonna be really good that we'll keep bending the curve. If we don't follow the rules, then all these things about a meatpacking plant, a prison, churches and outbreaks, what they tell us is that when people get together, we're vulnerable. And that's a terrible thing because nobody wants to be isolated, right? But isolation is a short term issue because in the long run, we will get effective vaccinations. We will have more and more effective therapy. So, where as we open up society, we do get out more. The rules of how to keep yourself safe and not be vulnerable do not change. Yeah, and I would like to say, you know, it's not, you know, as we do lessen the restrictions, it's not, it's still not living la vida loca and going out there and doing what you want to do. You it's know, not to, life back to normal. Right. To paraphrase Dr. Fauci yesterday, you know, we are not the end all be all. We are trying to give you the optimal information to protect yourself and protect our community. Um, it is up to our, our leaders and our, our elected officials to determine the best way to go about that. But our job is for the individual health and the public health and to give you the optimal, most up-to-date information to really try and protect everybody. And I think it's up to our leaders, but I would say to everyone out there, it's up to you. The, the way this is gonna go is a choice that each of us make on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. That will determine the outcome of the curve and how things go as we open up. And hopefully, we, because we all wanna open up more, right? I, I'd really, there are some things I'd like to get out and do, but it has to be done with social responsibility. You know, I might add that uh, it's interesting. Dr. Fauci is 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 really has done a great job on talking about the science. But I'd also say the, there are a few real lessons of history. You know, we talk about this being a once in a hundred year kind of deal, so swine flu. Yeah. And I think people have looked at that outbreak and said, "Wow, Philadelphia versus St. Louis. Yeah. Philadelphia had a rampant spread mm -hmm. asymptotic curve versus St. Louis at that time, which which shut down everything super early." And their curve. Well, that was actually Kansas City flattened. versus Kansas. Kansas City back then didn't do a very good job. Which but I thought it was, I thought it was an interesting this thing. Time. We've yeah. done better in Kansas City than St. Louis has done. And one of the questions we've had before is why. And I think part of it is we sheltered in place and closed schools earlier than St. Louis. And it does make a difference to do those things. Yeah. So, other yeah. questions? Yes. Oh. I think um, when we go back, we're kind of talking about two different worlds. You have people who are healthy um, and, and feel confident that they can get out there. But what is your message to people who have some of these underlying conditions, diabetes, maybe autoimmune, who are kind of in a place where they don't know what to do? Maybe they'll be going back to work. Uh, maybe their kids will be going back to school. I imagine nothing really changes for them because they're still as much at risk of severe disease. You bet they are still at risk, yeah. Dana. Big, yeah, they have to time. be much more cautious. I, I think they would, they just have to be um, cognizant that that, as best we know, what's going on in their bodies from a from an immuno. Um, 
com competence point is not as great as a what we call a healthy person, and um, and and really just have to say I'm going to be in this for a longer haul, perhaps in a more isolated uh, kind of environment, and. Um, because your health depends on it. It, it, it really, it really, really yeah, does. Unfortunately, there's no easy to answer to this no, because yeah, so. what's going to happen is that uh, if, you're, if you're younger with an immunocompromised illness, as you mentioned, diabetes, high blood pressure, lupus, mm -hmm. et cetera, and your kids go to school, they're going to have a higher risk of bringing that back to you. And the kids may be asymptomatic, so what do you do? Wash your hands, don't touch your face, try to shelter in place and minimize the risks as much as you can. There is no easy answer. Are you at more at risk when your kids go out and go back to school? Yes, you are. There's just no way around it. Um, but there are things you can try to do to mitigate that risk. And, and the, 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 if you're, depending on what your level of health is, the worse your health is, then you may have to think about more extraordinary measures. And, 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 and whether that's, you know, learning at home, trying to keep your kids homeschooled, or whatever, I, I don't know. That, that's a personal question that I can't yeah. answer. I can describe the medical thing pretty well. Yeah, absolutely. Um... To go back to both with what both of you said, you're absolutely more at risk. We know that, you know, from other experiences and uh, publications and records out there. Uh, but again, it goes back to the individual try to mitigate the risk as much as possible, doing those things that we've continued to to endorse, continuing to do those. And I think that way you can reduce your risk because yeah, you do have to get back out, you do have to work, you have to be in a workplace, you have to be at home. All of that. So. Yeah, it, it will be. And I don't think that we can't sugarcoat that one. It no. just is what it is. And Mary or Mark, do you, do you guys have young kids? What, what are you thinking about for your families at home? Yeah, you know, I have, I have three. I have uh, 18, 17, and 14. And, and you know, it's, it's a challenge, right? Because uh, mine are at the age where they're kind of, they're independent, obviously, and they want to be out with their friends. Um, they're looking for jobs. They're they're doing things and it's almost, uh, that that's, I and mean, I've talked to my wife about it, uh, Cindy, that's our biggest risk is it's our kids. Um, cause I can't control everything that they do all the time. And it's challenging. You know, my daughter's going back to college or is starting college this fall. And uh, it's a little anxiety provoking cause I, you know, I don't know what to think about it yet. And, you know, I appreciate the conversation you guys were having, uh, cause if they go off to college, I mean, it's, it's a lot of kids in a, in a small area, you know, I'll probably quarantine her when she comes back, if she comes back. So I'll be curious to see how this fall rolls out with, uh, with school. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, I have, I have uh, kids on the other end of the spectrum. I have a one-year-old, a five-year-old and an eight-year-old. Um, and you know, that, that's a source of anxiety for us because, uh, once, you know, we start reopening a little bit more, I know they want to see their friends and they want to go to the playground and, um, you know, we, we have concerns about that. We also right now have my 72 year old dad staying with us. Um, and he has, um, chronic medical conditions. So it's something that, you know, we're navigating, you know, how do we, uh, you know, let them be kids knowing that kids touch everything and they touch their faces and they don't cover their cough. Um, so yeah, definitely on our minds. Yeah, and as you can tell, none of us have a great answer to this question, unfortunately. I wish we did. Um, the, the best answer will be you can begin to take a deep breath when vaccinations are possible, when you have successful vaccinations, and as we define more effective therapy, even for the sicker. I think the next uh, six to eight weeks will be critical, both from a therapeutic standpoint, because we'll be getting more information in about some of these trials involving remdesivir and remdesivir and combinations of therapy. New drug therapy is further out, but repurposing old drugs is great. Um, and, then, and then I would say, um, I think that'll make a big difference. And then understanding the timeliness of the disease. I think we have time for one more question. Dr. With the restaurants, uh, sorry, with with restaurants and bars across the metro reopening or preparing to reopen, um, is it safe for people to be going out and spending time at a restaurant? Um, are there rules about distancing sufficient, and um, what should people do on an individual level to to make sure that they're remaining safe? That is a great question. You know, that's something I enjoy doing the most, Dana, is going out to a restaurant and having yeah. a, a great meal. But but it, it, it's there's a risk to it. There's let's kind of let's find our way through this a little bit and, and and make some suggestions of what will make a safer environment than a less safe environment. Yeah, um, I think to to start off, if if you can still get takeout, 
please get takeout. If you have to go out to a restaurant, I think it's important, especially now as the weather is getting nicer. Um, certainly being outside is probably going to be better and separated um, if the tables are separated by a distance. Um, minimum of six feet, if not more like eight to ten feet. Um, so if you cannot be in the confined space, that's going to be important. Um, and then as well, if you have to be in the confined space, then it's time. Obviously, you don't want to be in there too long. Uh, we know that there was that 10-minute rule um, proposed by Do uh, Mayor Lucas to help with contact tracing. So that is going to be the environment there. And then there are other individual things, you know, certainly um, wearing a mask to and from, using hand sanitizer, washing your hands just before eating. Um, ho hopefully the employees will have masks on, the servers, um, the waiters, waitresses, the cooks, things of that nature. Those are some small things that you can do um, and make sure that you can do to help maintain um, your risk mitigation of getting the disease. Those are some yeah, very basic things. The basic things are right. You, the, the tables have to be further apart, so they're at least six to ten feet apart, especially because back to back, one person yep, to another, you've got to be cool. pretty far yep. apart. Second of all, the, the, everybody inside that restaurant should have a mask on. I saw that, that they're saying servers should have masks on, but I don't know why cooks don't have masks right. on, because they're breathing over and cooking the food. So I'd say cooks and servers, you've got to be at least more than six feet apart, and there have to be lots of things to wash your hands around, mm -hmm. and it, it, it can't just be really up on you and you got to know that the employees are watching their hands you're washing your hands and everybody's trying to do that and then don't touch your face try to spend as little time as possible in that environment those things can make a difference mm -hmm. but it's still safer to eat at home so hey, dr sites just yes. I, I have one quick question for dr lisbon do people need to call ahead before coming into the er no no, that's never these, been. These our... guys are open twenty four seventy, and you don't need an appointment. <laughs> I, no, I they used to in the beginning. In the beginning, we said if you had COVID, we yeah. wanted you to call ahead. I think that's what they're trying to clarify. Can you clarify that? Hmm. I would suspect that if if the patient is a known COVID patient, um, calling ahead might be useful. But again, we are. Uh, I, I think I can say this: we're so adept mm -hmm. at triaging and getting people to where they need to be. Um, if we didn't have that knowledge beforehand, and we got it as you walked yeah. in to be triaged, we'd get you to It'd the right fine. place. Our, and people and are already in personal practice. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, they've yeah. evolved, and they, yeah. your team is ready for anybody, anytime, with Basically. or without COVID. Yeah. yeah. Maybe any we should come down and take some picture so we can show people what it looks like. Yeah. Sure, sure. We'll, we'll say something like that. Thank you, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. I just wanted to give a shout out to our emergency department nursing staff. I um, uh, nursing week ended last yesterday, and I didn't get a chance to uh, do it on the last segment. So uh, I really thank you guys for the, uh, yeah. the incredible work you do, kind of propping us up and and uh, being our hands, eyes, ears, and um, uh, foot, feet. Yeah, nursing team pandemic. everywhere. So, you know, take care of your people. We all have a home bubble. We've got a work bubble, and, and uh, <laughs> right. people are important everywhere we are. And, and most of all, take care of yourself. Don't let yourself get sicker waiting to be sick. Tomorrow, we're going to have uh, some important folks on who will help us address some of these questions. Dr. Raghu Adiga from Liberty Hospital, Larry Botts from Advent uh, Health Shiny Mission, and Mark Steele from Truman Medical Center, all chief medical officers, will do join Dana and I to talk a lot about how we're all making hospitals the safest places they can be. Until then, remember, there's still no place like home. Stay safe. Stay well.